Hi, my name is Inge, and I'm currently doing my master's at the University of Canterbury, and I'm doing it on can environmental DNA solve the braided river sampling conundrum to better inform management. So before I start, I'd just like to thank a couple of people. So firstly, my supervisors, Angus and Amy. I'd also like to thank Wilderlab. They've provided me with some kits, and Sean has been great help as well. And then Doc has helped me while, while I was working on the clearance, and then Waterways Centre as they provided me a scholarship for this year. So as we've talked about all day today, Braider Rivers are a very dynamic system. So we have a lot of connected terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems that are hotspots of biodiversity. The connected uh, aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems contain a lot of unique communities. As you can see, they contain threatened, robust grasshopper. They also contain difficult to sample groundwater crustaceans. They also contain the patchy and cryptic native galaxic fish. They also contain aquatic insects like mayflies, which further support native bird populations like the ribill. And then they also are infected, uh, affected by invaders. So we have this mosaic of different aquatic and terrestrial habitats. However, we don't quite understand what proportion of these habitats we need to sample to get an accurate representation of the biodiversity in these braided rivers. We're also not 100% sure on how each component, each terrestrial and aquatic component, contributes to the overall braided river biodiversity. So the lack of knowledge is usually due to our sampling challenges. So these rivers, like we've talked about a lot, they're complex, they're really big and they're hard to access. So it's impossible to get a sample representative with conventional approaches. This is becoming increasingly more important as human driven disturbances, such as the ones we've talked about, about today, like flood protection, agricultural encroachment and weeds. They constrain the flow and they stop this channel from migrating. This simplifies the river overall. We also don't know the whole, the whole effects of this simplification on the overall braided river biodiversity. So what I aim to do is I'm going to try and overcome these logistical and technical challenges by using the new molecular sampling technique, environmental DNA, otherwise known as eDNA. So organisms are continuously leaving eDNA in the environment. Let's imagine you're a trout finish fishing, uh, swimming around in the Rakai River. As you take a sharp corner, you brush up against a rock and you slough some skin. This is happening all the time in our braided rivers. Birds and, are sitting on the gravel, eating, breeding. We've got spiders hiding in the gravel, and we've also got fish and invertebrates swimming around. The conventional methods are spatially explicit when we try to pick up this information, whereas eDNA can pro provide information at the landscape scale. So my hypothesis for my um, research is that environmental DNA will provide an integrative sampling tool which captures terrestrial and aquatic biodiversity information at broader scales in braided rivers. And secondly, that river heterogeneity, for example, braiding intensity and lateral floodplain habitats, increases terrestrial and aquatic biodiversity in braided rivers. So this can inform management and um, improve the status of our biodiversity in braided rivers. So the way I did it is I started on the CAS, like a lot of other students, and I chose three main locations within the main braid. So I've got site one, blue, site two, orange, and then site three, green. Within each site, I put four replicates of eDNA filters, and they stay in there for 24 hours. I then come back the next day, and I'm able to take these filters out, put a preservative in, and then I can keep going with my fieldwork. In addition to this, what we did is we collected kicknet samples up to 2K from our eDNA locations, and we did this so that we could compare our conventional methods with these methods here. So what we were hoping is that we could get a broad scale and estimate species richness at that broader, larger scale of the landscape. So while I did it, I did a number of sampling methods. The first method that we tried was the syringe method. However, we quickly realized that trying to pump liters of water through this proved to be very difficult in braided rivers. We then changed to the dro, which you see in the middle. This is a 24 hour period. There's a filter in the back of that dro, and so the water is just trickling through that for 24 hours. However, again, braided rivers are so powerful that we had to change to a different method, and we found the mount. So basically, this is the same as the dro, but instead it's just the filters are on that metal bar that you see horizontally. So these are all preliminary results, so they are subject to change. 
But what we have found so far is that the filters outperform the syringes. So as you can see with the Waimakariri River, then the blue bars, round one we use the syringe, and you can see that the number of invertebrate species we detected is very low compared to when we use the filter. This is the same for the CAS. However, in the CAS River, you can see that in syringe round one, the species we detected were very low. And this is, as Holly mentioned, over the summer, there was really high sediment in the water here. So those syringes failed to collect as much water as we wanted. So we then went back for round two on the syringes. And as you can see, there was a much better improvement. And the species detected was much higher. Not as high as the filter, but it's definitely higher. Some reasons that these this might be a difference is because one, it's filtering more water. It's in there for 24 hours instead of time specific. And also it's collecting nocturnal material overnight. In addition, they're taking up more space. So like I said, I had four replicates within the braided river. So in the main braid, and it's usually spaced about for two meters. Whereas the syringes we were collecting at the side of the river just because of safety and accessibility. So it's very location and time specific. We then compared these to our KickNet samples that we gathered. So at the bottom there, you can see my eDNA site three, so my most downstream eDNA site. And upstream, all those blue waypoints are places where I took KickNet samples. So these are all places like One Tree Hill Spring, side braids, and they're slowly trickling information into that main braid. And as we've talked about before during today, is that all these lateral habitats, they contain a lot of biodiversity. So we wanted to see if our eDNA site at the bottom is able to collect all this lateral habitat biodiversity as well. And what we found is that it is picking up the information from our upstream habitats. So things that we are finding in the spring, we are finding in our eDNA main braid filter downstream of that. So not just picking up information from the main braid. While I was also looking through my kickmeat samples, it's very dominant as well that the main braid has a low abundance and low diversity. So these lateral habitats are very important as this is where our biodiversity and braided rivers are coming from. So one of the reasons why I chose the CAS is because Holly is working on it as well and she was doing a lot of fish data so I was able to compare it to that. And so all the fish data that she collected over the summer I got with my DNA filters as well. Something that was interesting was that even if a fish was present or absent in a main braid, we were still able to pick it up if it was present in one of the lateral habitats upstream. Another thought, something that was interesting was three species, the alpine galaxias, the rainbow trout, and the white tacky upland long jaw galaxias, were all not sampled by holly. Uh, this is interesting because they're probably coming up from much further upstream. For example, the white tacky upland long jaw is usually found at the springhead, which is about five kilometers upstream from these eDNA samples. So some questions we wanted to answer just because we are trying a new method is does placement matter? So as you saw earlier, we saw that we put those eDNA filters in three sites, all on the main braid. And you can see that for the most part, every single site picked up every single fish species. So that kind of shows us that there's no pattern, but it's consistently picking up. So say that if for the upland bully, if I only had one site, I would have still picked it up no matter where I had that filter. The only one that it doesn't have that is for the alpine galaxias in the CAS. So preliminary data suggests that where you put your filters at this point does not matter. Another question we wanted to answer are, are replicates important? So in science, we're always having replicates, but we weren't sure how many to use with our 24-hour filter system. So we sent three to Wilderland. So Wilderland, what they do is when they receive these, um, these kits, they're able to gather the information, and each genetic species has its own read of genetic read, and so they're able to just say which read belongs to what. And so what they uh, recommended is that we use six for the syringes, but they weren't 100% sure for the filters. So we decided to go with three. Here you can see again that for the most part, most replicates are picking up everything. So regardless if you have one or three replicates, you are going to pick up that species. However, something that was interesting was that for the Alpine Galaxias and the Waitaki Upland, which you saw earlier, they're rare and they're not as abundant. So this suggests to us that if you're wanting to pick up something that's further upstream, or if you're wanting to pick up something that isn't as abundant in the river, 
you're going to need more filters to pick it up. So the bigger picture, so our preliminary data suggests that environmental DNA has the chance to add valuable information at the landscape scale. So this could be used routinely as it is cost and time efficient. And this could also inform management that braided rivers need to be viewed as a holistic environment and not just in the um, not just in separated environments, but as an environment ecosystem as a whole. Thank you so much for that. That was really good. Okay, do we have any questions? Yeah, so those are things that we did think about doing within my thesis, but just because of the scope, we aren't able to do it. But lab experiments would be really helpful with this. We were thinking of doing some lab experiments over the winter at the CAS where it's a controlled environment, so we can see if a species is absent or present, how long that DNA is in that water for before we're not able to detect it anymore. But those are all those little things with eDNA that still need to be revised before you can actually answer those questions, yeah. But I'm not sure if we'll be doing that in my thesis, but yeah. Uh, so I just haven't got into that part yet. So I, yes, I will be able to do it. So those are the kind of uh, analyses that I'll be doing after this conference. Uh, we did pick up the endemic birds. So we are picking up birds, we're picking up terrestrial species, we are picking everything up. I just haven't analysed it enough to be able to put it in here today, but we are picking up those species. So we will be seeing what we're collecting and um, comparing it to other data as well to see if it's effective or not. Um, the only one will probably be groundwater. We, there's not a lot of information on that one, if we're able to detect things on that environment. Um, but apart from that, it looks like we're getting that landscape scale. We're also picking up plants and everything like that. So, yep. Uh, so that's kind of like borderline at the moment with eDNA. So we decided not to go with abundance. So we're just doing presence and absence, like you said. There are further studies that are kind of looking into the abundance of eDNA. So it does give you a total read. So basically, it will every time it picks up the wilder lab is able to pick up a read from a species it will count it as one so say it picks up that species 20 times it will give me the number 20. i'm not going to analyze that data just because we're not looking at abundance and there's still a little bit of uncertainty there so i'll be focusing on presence and absence but that's definitely the way to go in the future yeah. 